is a very, very excellent day that we get to spend time with you because Jesus is amongst us. And when he's with us, oh my goodness, nothing, nothing is impossible. So get on the phone, call and tell us how we can pray for you or leave your prayer request on our website. But uh, we're absolutely thrilled, thrilled that we get to spend time with you and get to minister to you today with the power of the word. Now, mom, you're talking about enemies here. What's going on with that? Well, the reason I brought that out is because all of us have some enemies, hmm. but how do you identify them and how do you get the word into the situation and circumstance to turn it around? And sometimes I have found I can be my worst enemy because hmm. I meditate on negative things hmm. and get into the, some of that. So I believe this teaching today will be transformational. Mm -hmm. I think it is so practical. It's where everybody lives. Mm -hmm. And you need to call us today. You say, well, I've got some enemies in my life. Well, call us for prayer, not for counsel, because God can even take your enemies and make them to be at peace with you. Call us or get on the website and identify what God can do in your enemies. I'm going to ask you to turn to Psalm 27. Who doesn't love the Psalms? They are so wonderful. And you know, the Psalms basically were written as a song book. This is the longest book of the Bible. This is the book most quoted by Jesus in the New Testament. And this book is the most quoted in the New Testament. It was divided basically into five segments. If you're watching on television, I want you to get hold of this. And in these five segments, the first grouping of psalms were called Genesis Psalms because these first 42 psalms really had to do with God's beginning. You know, if you read Psalm 1, I mean, it's just a real basic thing with God. And so if you wanted to sing about the solidity of God, the beginning of God, His stabilizing, His foundation, well, you'd go to this part of the songbook. If you wanted to get a song a psalm you wanted to sing about getting free from something. You know, you're very uh, bound by fear, depression, maybe some kind of a habit. Oh, well, you would go from Psalm 43 to 79, and those are called Exodus Psalms. And so they're redemption psalms. So you'd pick out one of those, and you would sing that psalm. You'd mem memorize that psalm. You'd meditate on that psalm. Because the Word sets you free. Isn't that true? The truth sets you free. Then if you wanted a psalm, oh, that just really, you know, you said, I just want to know how to worship God. I want to know how to love Him. I want to know how to behave in church. I want to know how to behave in His presence. Well, that grouping of psalms was called the Leviticus Psalms. So you say, oh, these are named after the first five books of the Bible. You're right, you're right. So you'd pick out the psalm you wanted to sing in that grouping of psalms. Then if you said, well, I want to look back and be encouraged. I, you know, I'm discouraged about the way things are going in the world, things are going in our city and our state and our nation. So what would you do? Well, the next grouping of psalms were called the number psalms. And the book of Numbers has to do with history. It's the rehearsing of what God did with them and taking them into the promised land, taking them out of Egypt. It rehearses their history. So sometimes we need to look back and encourage ourselves and say, well, if God did it then, he can do it now. But the last grouping of Psalms are my favorite. And these are the Deuteronomy Psalms. And all of these Psalms have to do with emphasis on the Word. Psalm 119 is in this grouping of Psalms. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. And every verse, every coupling of verses has to do with the power of the Word. So Psalms was written to be sung to meditate on, to encourage you, to give you direction. And they were written out of people's experiences with God. So if we look at the Psalms, we say, well, David probably wrote most of them. That's true. Solomon wrote some of them. Moses wrote some. Asaph wrote some. The sons of Korah wrote some. And some of them are called orphan Psalms because they don't know who wrote them. But people, in their experience with God, they would 
psalm, they would center in on God, and then they would just let God speak to them, and then they would begin to sing it or speak it out. And so often it would rhyme, it would be sung. And in the New Testament, it tells you the same thing, speaking to yourself in psalms and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And, you know, we saw that ministry very strongly through Wally. By the way, I saw Wally tonight before I came. He said, tell you hello. You know, I said, pray for me. Well, he said, I do it every day. And I have a wild thing to tell you. Uh, one of the caregivers came over in front of him, and uh, we were having dinner together. And she said, you know, Pastor Wally, every day he sings four or five times here. I said, really? He said, she said, yeah, the people want him to sing. So he says, what do you want me to sing? But it has to be religious. <laughs> so he sings, oh, rugged cross, amazing grace. But she said he does it four or five times a day. It's a great lift here. I looked at him, I said, is this true? He said, true. And he smiled. But I think of him, especially in his psalming, prophetic psalming, because much of his prophecy would rhyme. And he got into that flow some years ago. I see Pat Mahoney moving in the same thing. Sarah, I think I've seen you on occasion also move in that rhyming. What is that? That is psalming. And that's what we're looking at tonight. We're looking at a psalm that was for an occasion in this person's life. And Psalm 27, half of the psalm is really about just saying how wonderful God is, how great his salvation is, but half of it is on really fear, and is half of it is on enemies. Now, I have chosen to put this on the screen because I want to read it out of the message uh, Bible because it is so wild and crazy, and I like it. It just seems very applicable. So uh, the, it's up there, and I'm going to read it. You can read it as you watch. Light, space, zest, that's God. So with him on my side, I'm fearless, afraid of no one and nothing. When vandal hordes ride down, ready to eat me alive, those bullies and toughs would fall flat on their faces. When besieged, I'm calm as a baby. When all hell breaks loose, I'm collected and cool. I'm asking God for one thing, only one thing, to live with him in his house my whole life long. I'll contemplate his beauty. I'll study at his feet. That's the only quiet, secure place in a noisy world, the perfect getaway, far from the buzz of traffic. God holds me head and shoulders above all who try to pull me down. I'm headed for his place to offer anthems that will raise the roof. Already I'm singing God's songs. I'm making music to God. So this is a real, oh, I'm just worshiping God. He's my salvation. He's taking me through. But then in the second part, he gets into anxiety and fear and enemies. Listen, God, I'm calling at the top of my lungs. Be good to me. Answer me. When my heart whispered, seek God, my whole being replied, I'm seeking him. Don't hide from me now. You've always been right there for me. Don't turn your back on me now. Don't throw me out. Don't abandon me. You've always kept the door open. My father and my mother walked out and left me, but God took me in. Point me down your highway. God, direct me along a well-lighted street. Show my enemies whose side you're on. Don't throw me to the dogs, those liars who are out to get me, filling the air with their threats. I'm sure now I'll see God's goodness in the exuberant earth. Stay with God. Take heart. Don't quit. I'll say it again. Stay with God. And so he starts talking about his fears, his anxieties. But he said, you know, let's hang in with God. So let's look at this psalm. Let's let the Holy Spirit talk to us in this psalm tonight. And I'm going to be dealing with five enemies that we hit. And these five enemies you can win over. But how do you win? And what are your five worst enemies? You say, my mother-in-law. No, no, no. <laughs> and so let's see who your five worst enemies are and look at it. Because the Lord is your light. He is your salvation. Whom shall you fear? The Lord is the strength of your life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. So he is saying, wow, 
you know, I have enemies, but they're not a problem. They just stumble and fall. And so he's just exuberant in his faith. And then he says, though an army, not just one enemy, a whole army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war, not just an army, but a whole war may rise against me, and this I will be confident. And then he said, just one thing, I'm focusing on one thing I've desired of the Lord, that I will seek him, I'll dwell in his house, I'll behold his beauty, and I'll inquire in his temple. So we look and see, let's praise God before we get into our fears. Usually we tend to pray our fears first. Are you watching on television? You know, you can call us if you're in fear because we'll pray with you, not counsel you. But usually we present our fears first. But here, he didn't do that, and I like this. He presented the bigness of God first, and then he dealt with his fears and dealt with his enemies. So how big is God? He's big enough to take care of one enemy. He's big enough to take care of an army. He's big enough to take care of a war. So my first thing is going to be, I'm going to seek God and not just be drawn aside by enemies. I'm not going to just be drawn aside by armies, by wars. God will see me through. So he really gets into worship and praise before he begins to deal with the enemies. We are so excited because for the first time in the history of our ministry, we get to do a group trip, Mom, and bring you with us to Ethiopia. Oh, and I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am that you can come with us and minister and see amazing things in Ethiopia. Mom, tell us what some of the things are that we're well, seeing. Well, we're going to visit Aksum. And Aksum is where they say they have the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, Ethiopia is mentioned over 90 times in the Bible. That is so interesting there. And then we're going to be going to Lalibela, which is where the Rock Hewn Church is. That is considered one of the seven wonders of the world in this timing. And of course, the healing meetings we will have in Addis Ababa. You will love it. And God wants you to go. Why? Because I want you to use your hands to lay hands on the sick and to help us bring a great revival to this wonderful nation. Come with us. Your gift of support makes it possible to keep encouraging faith-building teaching like this coming to you and your neighbors. And right now, if you can share a gift of any size, we want to say thank you by rushing you the five-part audio series titled Psalms, A Pathway to the Heart of God. In these teachings, Marilyn and Sarah show you how to use the Psalms as a roadmap into God's presence and power. And for a limited time, if you can share a seed gift of $50 or more, we'll include two of Marilyn's personal hardcover study books. Hebrew Honey is an incredible resource filled with word studies that simplify the basic meanings of Hebrew root words. Each selected word from the Bible was traced to its Hebrew origin and explained simply for you to enjoy. Psalms Classic Edition is a beautiful gold edge book that explains each of the 150 Psalms, complete with the Psalms Crisis Concordance to help guide you through everyday struggles. To sow a seed gift and receive your special thank you resources, call or click right now. Now, five enemies. And I want to look at them, but I don't want to just talk about them. I want to win over them tonight. How many of you like to be winners? I like to win. You know, Wally and I used to play cards, Rook, and some various card games with his father and mother. And uh, I would be his father's partner. And, oh, he'd get so mad if we didn't win. I mean, he'd just get furious. He'd say, well, it's your fault. If you just turn the switch on and get your brain on, we would have won. So it was a big thing, you know. He wanted to win at Rook if I was going to be his partner. Think it through, we were supposed to win. But, you know, what's Rook? That's just a silly little game, entertaining. Probably he was too serious over it. But in this life, we need to win over enemies because this is a very serious thing. So what's the first enemy that... I want to deal with, and I want to deal with imaginary enemies. Because I believe a lot of things, people, situations, circumstances we look at are really not enemies. I think we imagine them. Now, I want to take Saul and David. Saul thought David was his enemy. David was not his enemy. Saul was jealous over David. He was sure David was trying to take the throne over, away from him. 
He was jealous right after David killed Goliath because these women sang this song. You know, Saul's killed his thousands. David has killed his ten thousands. And so he imagined, I've got to kill David. He's the biggest enemy I have. But David was not Saul's enemy. He was not his enemy at all. In fact, David loved Saul. And he highly esteemed his anointing. And all the way to the end of David's life and the end of Saul's life and the tragedy of Saul's life, David esteemed Saul. So could you have some imaginary enemies? Yes, you could. And I think all of us tonight probably sitting here can imagine some things. So I'm going to tell you some things about my life. I remember there was a certain ministry in another country And I went and spoke in their church several times, big, big church, big ministry, and they didn't invite me back. So I thought, they don't like me. And then every now and then I'd see them at some big world conference, and they weren't just real friendly. And I thought, yeah, I knew they didn't like me. And I built up this big case. Well, I probably am not deep enough spiritually, and I probably don't have enough scripture. And so if that person ever was brought up, I didn't talk about it, but I thought, yeah, they're a good ministry, but they don't like me. They have poor taste. (laughs) And so several years ago, I got a book that was written by the leaders of this ministry, and in it they had a chapter on me. And they just exalted me and said, oh, this is one of the most wonderful ministries we ever had in our church. We just so respect her. We love her. I thought, good night. I've been thinking bad things for years. And it wasn't true. Are you hearing me? And folks, we can get into meditating on bad things and imagine things that are not there, that are not planted there. And I think it comes out of rejection. We kind of look for rejection. So I want you to stand up. I want to pray for you. Because that, what you do is you meditate on that. And that's meditating on negative thinking. And the Bible says whatsoever things are pure and lovely and a good report, think on these things. You're thinking on wrong things. So you have imaginary enemies. So what am I going to pray over? Your brain. So put your hand on your head. Say, Father, I don't want to live in vain imaginations. I want to live in what the Word says. I want to meditate on things that are good, pure, lovely, good report. So I I want right now for strongholds of wrong imaginations to fall down, fall down in Jesus' name. And I'm taking the Word of God into the place, and I meditate on it, that I'm surrounded with favor. It's like a shield around me. I love people, and people are wild over me. Hallelujah! Now keep standing. I'm not through with you, because I feel the Holy Spirit has something more. What was Saul's problem? He had a spirit of fear, right? What are imaginary enemies? They're spirits of fear that attack us, and we yield to them. But David had the opposite. He didn't have a spirit of fear, but he had the fear of God. And what God wants you to have tonight is not a spirit of fear, but the fear of God. And God says, meditate on things that are pure and lovely. So put your hand back on your head. Say, I do not not have a spirit of fear. I fear God, God. but I don't have a spirit of fear. I'm free from junky fear. In Jesus' name, and everyone said amen. Okay, sit down. Imaginary enemies, okay? And then I have found enemies can come in degrees, kind of processing. You know, somebody says some little thing, and you think, well, yeah, I don't know if they really meant it that way. But, you know, you keep meditating on it, thinking on it, And then they say something else or somebody says something and then it begins to escalate and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what are you into? You're into a fear thing and it's an escalation. And the Bible tells us that God didn't give us a spirit of fear so it didn't come from God, did it? Who did it come from? Listen, I believe a spirit of fear comes from the devil. 
I think he plays that tune the loudest that he can play. I think it's one of the things we have to resist and be aware of. And perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. Fear has torment. So don't let live in torment. Rebuke it, bind it, get free from it. That is very, very important. Now I'll tell you how God helped me get free from some of this kind of junk that comes along because it does to everybody. I got upset because some years ago, someone worked for us and I love them very much and they left the ministry, don't work for us, don't come here to church and it bothered me. And I went through my list, I've been good to them, I've always been nice, why don't they come, blah, 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 blah. And every time I'd hear their name, it was a downer with me. And every time I'd get into that process of thinking, and I noticed negative thinking is often tries to attack me when I'm driving the car, because your head is kind of loose-ended, you know what I'm saying? When you can kind of do things automatically. And I would think about this. And one day I said, Lord, I don't like this kind of thought. And it hurts me. I keep getting hurt over and over and over and over by this person. And the Lord said to me, well, I can tell you how to be free. I said, tell me how. He said, cast the care on me. I, he said, whether they, they're bad, mad at you or glad at you, whether they meant bad things or they did bad things or they said bad things or thought bad things, he said, just give it to me and I'll take care of it. It's not even your problem. And it was so simple, I thought, oh, wow. Well, okay. I just cast that person. I cast that negative circumstance. I cast that negative thinking on you. So, you know, later in the day it came back and I said, no, 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 no. I cast that on the Lord. That doesn't belong to me. No, 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 no. I, that, that's not mine. And so, you know, it would come back, come back, come back. And I would say it maybe took a month or two and now I'm free. If that person comes to mind, I think, thank God I don't have that. The Lord's carrying that. And then I even feel love in my heart for the person. I feel it. I don't just say it. So what should we do with these kind of things? And some of them are very real. What should we do? Cast them on the Lord. So stand back up. You said, I knew you were going to do this. <laughs> stand back up. Those of you watching on television, we're going to cast this person on the Lord. So put your hands up, say, okay, okay. here they are. Yeah. They don't belong to me because I'm giving them to you, God. They're not my problem. They're your problem. And I'm free from the problem. And you take the problem and you make it work for good. So I'm saying, bye-bye problem. God has the problem. God has that enemy, not mine belongs to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I think in this degrees of enemies, sometimes we can be making the problem. Now, if you look at David, basically Saul was jealous of him. David could really use weapons well. He killed a lion, he killed a bear, he killed Goliath. He was cool with weapons. David could write songs. You know, David had a sweet walk with God. David had great favor with people. I mean, people really liked him. David was excellent in the military. I mean, wherever, wherever David went, people were just impressed with him. And it made Saul jealous. And so check yourself out. Is jealousy at the root of it? It probably is. <laughs> So many times when I really get down to the basic, what is the problem here? I find I have some jealousy there that I need to repent of and get free of. But also we could step into a place where we make people jealous. We see that they're jealous, so we just show off a little more. And folks, that's not good.
Your gift of support makes it possible to keep encouraging faith-building teaching like this coming to you and your neighbors. And right now, if you can share a gift of any size, we want to say thank you by rushing you the five-part audio series titled Psalms, A Pathway to the Heart of God. In these teachings, Marilyn and Sarah show you how to use the Psalms as a roadmap into God's presence and power. And for a limited time, if you can share a seed gift of $50 or more, we'll include two of Marilyn's personal hardcover study books. Hebrew Honey is an incredible resource filled with word studies that simplify the basic meanings of Hebrew root words. Each selected word from the Bible was traced to its Hebrew origin and explained simply for you to enjoy. Psalms Classic Edition is a beautiful gold edge book that explains each of the 150 Psalms, complete with the Psalms Crisis Concordance to help guide you through everyday struggles. To sow a seed gift and receive your special thank you resources, call or click right now. I want to take just a few moments here to minister to you about relationships. And the truth of it is, we all have various kinds of relationships. We have shallow kind of surface acquaintances. We have ones that are a little more deep. Then we have some very, very core essential relationships. And we have them across the whole spectrum. We have family relationships. We have friends at school. We have work relationships. All kinds of different relationships in our lives. And if you're like me, sometimes those can be hot spots. Sometimes we have family relationships that are hot spots. So you think, ooh, conflict. Uh, sometimes there are work relationships where there's misunderstandings and there's tension and insecurities and all these areas can get a little tricky for us. But I want to encourage you to get on the phone, call right now, get on our website, leave a prayer request for your relationships, for your family. Maybe you have loved ones who don't know Christ and you really want them to know Christ. Or you have friends or co-workers, people in your, in your school that don't know Christ and you really want them to have a very vibrant experience with Christ. Well, get on the phone, get on our website, let us know how we can pray for these individuals. But also I wanna encourage you that when we have relationship struggles and conflicts, that God is there to speak to us, to encourage us and to lead us into truth. Because I have found this in my own life. When I have uh, conflicts and, and you know, there's kind of some tension and some struggles in relationships, I found that God often wants to help me grow as an individual, not only to, to resolve the conflict, but also to understand who I am better and as well to learn how to communicate more effectively and how to be more loving. So I just want to encourage you, when you have conflicts and struggles in relationships, there are opportunities for God to do amazing things in your heart. So hop on the phone, get on the website. We want to pray for you and all of the relationships that you have. 